Thank you for joining us for today's presentation by Don Gurnett, PhD, the J.A. Van Allen and R.J. Carver Professor of Physics and Astronomy here at the University of Iowa. He's going to speak to us today on 60 years of space research at Iowa, the legacy of James A. Van Allen. I'm Dave Martin, ICFRC board president and host for today's program. I'm pleased and honored to announce that 2018 is our 35th anniversary for hosting community lunch and forums to address topics of international interest. Applause is okay, 35 years. <laughs> Uh, we thank our members, volunteers, and interns for making these forms possible since the year that Ronald Reagan declared the Global Positioning Satellite, GPS, available for civilian use in 1983. I want to acknowledge our university and community supporters, the University of Iowa's International Programs, the University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa's Center for Public Policy, and the Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization for their financial support, and today's special sponsors, Conrad Schultz and Karen and Wallace Chapel. Don Gurnett started his science career by working on spacecraft electronics design as a student employee in the University of Iowa Physics Department in 1959. After completing his BS in electrical engineering at Iowa, he transferred to physics, where he received his MS and PhD degrees, PhD degrees in 1963 and 1965. He spent one year from 64 to 65 as a NASA trainee at Stanford University, was appointed assistant professor at the University of Iowa in 1965, with subsequent promotions to associate professor and to professor in 68 and 72. Don specializes in the study of pl space plasma physics and has participated in over, over 40 spacecraft projects, most notably the Voyager 1 and 2 flights to the outer planets the Galileo mission to Jupiter, and the Cassini mission to Saturn. He is the author and co-author of over 650 scientific publications. He's received many awards, including the M.L. Hewitt Faculty Award, the Iowa Region Award for Faculty Excellence, and elected membership in the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Don's going to describe the events leading up to the discovery of Earth's radiation belts, and the tremendous expansion of space research at Iowa over the next 60 years, including the construction of seven successful Earth-orbiting spacecraft and instrumentation on some 70 spacecraft. Please join me in welcoming Don Gurnett. Well, thank you for that uh, introduction. Now, when Ed uh, Zastro called me and asked me to speak, which was a couple months ago, I suggested that we put it on this day, February 1st, uh, 1958, uh, because that turns out to be the 60th anniversary of the beginning of American space science, specifically by the launch of, uh, due to the launch of Explorer 1 with its successful instrument built at the University of Iowa uh, 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 to measure cosmic rays, but instead he just he discovered something totally unexpected, namely the radiation belts around Earth. And that put Iowa on the map as far as doing space research, which did not exist up until that time. And it's been growing ever since. Now, I want to talk a bit about Van Allen's role in that discovery. And I also want to talk about what's been achieved over by the University of Iowa over the intervening years. I don't want anybody here to leave thinking that we aren't still solidly in that business of doing space research. Uh, so if you, let's see, I guess I'm the guy that, do, that does this. I'm the projector operator. So there's my, uh, there's my title, 60 Years of Space Research at Iowa the legacy of James Van Allen. And uh, now, Jim Van Allen was born in Mont Pleasant. Uh, he went to school at Iowa Wesleyan. And uh, I, th I believe, if I remember right, he, he got an uh, undergraduate degree there in 1935, then came to Iowa and got his PhD in, in nuclear physics in 1939. Uh, and then uh, he ended up working at the 
Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab in Baltimore, Maryland. And during World War II, he did work on proximity fuses uh, for anti-aircraft shells, that kind of thing that would go up and go near, it would pass near an airplane, it would explode. And uh, the Applied Physics Lab got its funding primarily uh, from the U.S. Navy, uh, navigation of ships and things like that. And after the war ended, uh, the U.S. Uh, captured uh, quite a large number on the order of 100 uh, V-2 rockets that Werner von Braun had developed during the war to, I hate to say this, bombard London, of which they had uh, some, something like 3,000 rockets bombarded London. Well, uh, Jim Van Allen was interested at that time in cosmic rays. There are these particles that come down and go through your body every day. And uh, we didn't really, we still don't completely really know where they're coming from, but the idea was to understand these things a little better. And uh, uh, he got to know uh, Von Braun, who had been uh, uh, willingly came to this country uh, after the war. And uh, he made an arrangement uh, to fly Geiger tubes uh, on V2s. Uh, captured V2s, and there's a picture of such a captured V2 rocket over here on the left <coughs> left-hand side, which you may not, I don't know if this pointer really helps right there. And uh, that operation uh, started in 1946, and he was on the very first one to be flown. And I might, as just a data point, I was six years old in 1946, <laughs> just to get you, get you oriented on ages here. And, uh, and so he worked on that for several years, and they showed that there were some very interesting things about the way the cosmic ray counting rate varied with altitude. But the facts were, uh, at the Applied Physics Lab, they were really interested primarily in military things, and this was science. So he started looking around for an academic position. And, uh, and that uh, turned out, he turned back to his alma mater, uh, the University of Iowa, and he was selected head of the physics department and came here in 1951. Now, the second picture over here, which I, you in the back probably have a hard time seeing, uh, another way of studying cosmic rays was with balloons, putting a Geiger tube and carrying it up with a balloon to high altitude, and that's what he did in Iowa. And that was, a, that was a big step down from flying on V2s. And uh, here's a quote, and there's a very good book here on Van Allen, written by Abigail Forstner. I don't know if you've seen this. Go down to the bookstore and get it. It's got really a lot of inter interesting things there about Van Allen that I will not be able to cover. But I do want to have a, one quote, quote here. Uh, Van Allen was hired as head of the physics department in 1951 to do any research he wanted with only one catch, no money. <laughs> so that was kind of a, sl a slim time for him and uh, stepped down launching balloons and he had a campaign, actually he had connections with the Navy. Uh, in fact, the Navy at that time funded a lot of research. In fact, I would say in the United States, most re uh, scientific research was funded uh, by the Navy. So the next thing that happened which I'm going to ask how many people uh, remember this, is Sputnik 1. How many uh, remember that event? Quite a few, actually. It has something to do with the age distribution of the organization <laughs> there. And I uh, arrived here. Uh, I went to a small school in Fairfax, Iowa. There were seven in my graduating class and two in the class behind, just to kind of give you an orientation of my back educational background. Uh, I arrived here and I think it was around September 20th of 1957 to go into electrical engineering. And uh, just, uh, just five or ten, six days or so after that, Sputnik 1 was launched. And uh, you, those of you that remember that event, they uh, published the time when you could go outside and watch Sputnik go over. It had to be after sunset where the spacecraft was illuminated by the sun, but it was dark down in the ground. 
And I had uh, also worked on rockets in high school. I might ask how many people here have done that. Uh, uh, there's a couple. Yeah, I used saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur. It was a mixture I found in the, uh, the, uh, that the Chinese used, and I, I found that in a book in the Cedar Rapids Library. So I was interested in that kind of thing. And also in high school, I got involved in a model airplane club there that had a lot of uh, people from Collins Radio, adults, about half adults, half kids. And, uh, and they were experimenting with radio-controlled models. Nowadays, that, that sounds like toys. But nowadays, they call them drones, right? And that's a more respectable thing to work on. And they use tubes. And uh, so uh, I had quite a knowledge, quite a bit of knowledge about electronics, actually, when I came. That's why I went, in, into, uh, I went into electrical engineering. Now, uh, the U.S. response to Sputnik and I don't know how many of you remember this. The United States actually had two programs underway to try to launch a satellite. One was run by the Navy uh, called Vanguard, which I shall talk about. And the other one was run by Von Braun down at the Redstone Arsenal. Now, Von Braun wanted to try to, he was developing intermediate range ballistic missiles. And he wanted to try to launch a satellite. Uh, but Eisenhower, who was president, uh, refused to let him try to do that. After all, he was afraid of sending, it was the middle of the Cold War, and uh, he was afraid of sending a U.S. object over, over Russia, especially one being developed by Werner von Braun, who was their arch enemy during World War II. So he had refused von Braun permission. Uh, to use a, a rocket called a Redstone, uh, an upgrade version actually, uh, to try to launch a satellite. Now the Navy was empowered to try to build a rocket that could launch a satellite, but that program, I judge, was going rather slowly. And I want, and of course, as soon as Sputnik was launched, suddenly the whole thing changed. Eisenhower wanted us to launch something. This was the beginning of what we call the space race, and. Uh, uh, so the Navy proceeded to get their vehicle ready for launch. It was called Vanguard. And uh, uh, here's a picture of the spacecraft. It weighed three pounds. And it was about the size of a grapefruit. Uh, Sputnik was about this big and weighed 183 pounds. That in itself is humiliating, <laughs> I thought. I remember this very vividly. Uh, and the rocket was a long, thin rocket. And, uh, and on December 6th of 1957, uh, they attempted to launch, you already get the hint here when I said attempted to launch Vanguard 3. And uh, for some reason, I always enjoy uh, watching this video, which was on television. I don't think it was re real time as I remember it, but I do remember this in fact exactly when, uh, when, they, when they tried this. So uh, let me run the video here. And, and listen carefully now. The exact cause is classified. Did you hear that? <laughs> I have to tell you, that was humiliating. That is, that is what I thought at the time. And uh, meanwhile, von Braun was putting his rocket together. And because of his connections with Van Allen, they decided to put a uh, Geiger tube counter for studying cosmic rays uh, on this uh, spacecraft. And it consisted of two things. The rocket, which was an upgraded version of the Redstone Intermediate range ballistic missiles called the Jupiter C. And it had an upper stage here, which was provided by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And it, it consisted of several solid propellant rockets in kind of a canister that was being spun by an electric motor for stabilization. In fact, it's just like when you throw a football and spin it. That was part of the uh, stabilization. 
and not a lot of fancy electronics because there wasn't any fancy electronics then. It's so a very simple idea. And uh, then here's the spacecraft sitting on top of the rocket, which you can hardly see in that picture, but it has a blown up, uh, some blown up deal. Now the spacecraft was built by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. They specialized during World War II in rocket, solid rocket uh, development. And uh, Van Allen's Geiger tube is right here. And there was some electronics with it. And there were really only two people involved. Uh, there was Van Allen and George Ludwig from Tiffin, Iowa. And he was a, uh, a graduate student. He was a student in electrical engineering, except he was more advanced than I was. He was up to near the senior level. And uh, on February 1st, let's see, go to the next slide. Uh, now, let me talk about February 1st. You'll see in the newspapers, perhaps, that it was January 31st. Uh, it depends upon whether you talk about Eastern time or Universal time, which is at Greenwich, England, and I always use Greenwich time, uh, which was February 1st, 1958. So here's the actual launch, and uh, I always enjoy playing this. I, I, I have a thing about watching rocket launches. <laughs> it's just one of my things. So. Hopefully it uh, didn't run. Just a minute, let me try it again. Oops. Well, I'm sorry about that. Well, we'll try again here. Five, four, three, two, one. High command, high command. High command. Now watch that stage up there. You can see it rotating in the next frame. See it spinning? Right there. And so the rocket was programmed to fly, fly up on kind of an arc and at an altitude of about 100 miles where it would be horizontal. It ran out of fuel. They fired the final stages and it went in orbit. And indeed, it worked. Uh, and this is a, a really kind of an iconic picture, I think, uh, taken, interestingly enough, at the uh, National Academy of Science in Washington, D.C. Now, if it had been me, I just stayed down to Cape Kennedy, Cape Canaveral it was called, and watched it launch. But they were confident enough, they flew to Washington, D.C. for news purposes to be there uh, to announce success. Now, if it didn't work, I don't know what they were planning to do, but, you know. <laughs> and it's a picture of uh, a model of the, of the spacecraft. And my, uh, my pointer is failing. Oh, there it goes. There is the model. This is a solid propellant rocket, and this is the spacecraft section up here. And the people here are uh, Bill Pickering, who is the head of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at Pasadena, California, Jim Van Allen, and Werner von Braun, uh, the German rocket scientist who was recruited after the war. And uh, so the, the spacecraft worked. It went around the Earth, you know, and taking about an hour and a half. And it took some time to realize this, but uh, they first thought that the Geiger tube was not working because it wasn't counting. But after some study, they realized that the reason it wasn't counting sometimes is the radiation intensity was so high it was saturating the instrument. And it took, uh, actually, uh, uh, the problem was that they only had limited, most, in most cases, just radio uh, radio fans, you know what I mean, people that would st that like to record radio signals, uh, ham radio people is what I really meant. Uh, and so they didn't have very many recordings around the earth. And uh, and so there was a guy in our machine shop uh, who, I've, who I knew very well, Ed Freund. I don't know anybody recognize his name. He's died. But uh, he built a little tape recorder, uh, a copy of which is in, th in the Smithsonian and it would record the data for one orbit, and then they could play that back. And when they did that, they could see that there were definitely certain regions around the Earth which had very high radiation intensities. And this plot shows that. Uh, there were actually two, uh, in, uh, two very intense zones called the inner and the outer zone, uh, now known to be mainly protons, and the outer zone was electrons. And uh, so this was the first great discovery of the space age. 
uh, the, the radiation intensities are so high, they are definitely hazardous to humans. Uh, the space station, which we have up now, flies under that uh, radiation belt. And, uh, and this discovery uh, stimulated a huge amount of worldwide interest in other countries. That's my foreign relations part. <laughs> uh, to, uh, to, you know, study this new phenomena. And for several years, the University of Iowa was simply the center of space research, uh, research on radiation belts. We had, to, we had conf uh, conferences here and, and, a, and a huge effort on building uh, uh, other new spacecraft. Now, having seen all this in the newspaper, I just couldn't resist going over to Van Allen's office and asking if I could have a job. So in April, 1958, I went to his office, acquired about a job, and he eventually hired me. I, he didn't hire me that day, but he sent me a, sent me a note uh, saying that he would like me to work in his group. And you might, I've often wondered why. <laughs> well, the reason was the space program was just expanding, you know, like exponentially. And they needed people here. It was really just Van Allen and George Ludwig, and then there are a couple of their faculty members, uh, well, not even faculty members, uh, one of them, uh, uh, like Carl McElwain, he was, he was actually studying music, and he got interested in this work with Van Allen. And then there was a physicist by the name, name, name of Ernie Ray, and they, they did some important things on understanding how, that, uh, how the radiation belt worked. In particular, they quickly understood, uh, developed the understanding that the particles spiral around the magnetic field and bounce between two mirror points. I, I could give you a long lecture on that, but I'll, I'll spare you of that. Uh, so the first project I was assigned to work on was uh, called S-46. Uh, 46 wasn't the 46 spacecraft to be launched, it was proposal number 46. <laughs> and it would have been uh, Explorer 8 uh, had it been launched successful. But it was not, the rocket uh, blew up. And that was typical of the time. About 50% of the rockets in those days uh, uh, simply didn't work. And um, I got rather involved, I mean, let me tell you how much involved I was. Uh, we had a typical working situation of uh, like 80 hours a week. And I'm a, I'm a student. So you're trying to go to class and try to keep up, but this was so interesting, you know. <laughs> and in fact, I'll have to say that uh, even though I worked on, I'll call them model rockets, with saltpeter, charcoal, and sulfur in high school, it was less than a year later I was down at Cape uh, Canaveral working on real rockets. Uh, so, I mean, that's, that's hard to do today. Uh, it, it would be really hard to get into that kind of a situation. Now, uh, okay, now let me comment on S-46. I, I worked with a graduate student, John Freeman, uh, and we worked on a specific type of detector to detect plasmas. And, uh, and of course, S-46, the rocket failed. Uh, so I was then assigned to work on a, uh, what we call an encoder on Explorer 12. It took quite a while uh, to get that developed. Now, as an encoder, we had to take data from several sources, combine it together, and really the idea of digital things didn't exist in those days. It may have been from some people, but they had a really crude uh, system of transmitting data back to the ground. And uh, this uh, spacecraft, uh, was at the Naval Research Lab we had to go and work on. NASA was created in July, I believe it was, in 1958. Uh, that was on paper. But it took several years before NASA developed buildings and people and everything. And the people I was working with, the engineers I was working with at the Naval Research Lab, uh, eventually ended up at Goddard Space Flight Center. But at this time, they were really working for the Navy. Now, I want to tell you a few things about this. Um, I remember flying to, uh, I went, flew many times to uh, Naval Research. It's right across the river from uh, Reagan Airport, uh, across the Potomac there. And I remember, uh, let me talk about the Cold War now. I remember going in there just hoping that the Russians 
didn't bomb Washington while I was there. Now, my, my kids, when I tell them that, they laugh like I'm crazy. But let me tell you, during that era, people were really afraid of that kind of thing. Anybody else remember? Can, you, can anybody support my statement? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, actually, there was a very brisk business in selling bomb shelters. You could buy them in Iowa, right? Concrete bunkers that you could dig a hole in the ground, put it next to your house in case you had a bomb. So that was, that was a situation uh, with the Soviets. Now, later as my career got more advanced, uh, the Soviet Union was very uh, proud of their space program and they started inviting U.S. scientists, and I did become a scientist uh, not long after that, uh, and we would go to those meetings. And I think we, we were probably one of the only uh, groups in the United States that had direct connections with, uh, with uh, Soviet, uh, any Soviet people. And uh, actually, the scientists got along quite well. There was a lot of competition. In fact, I would say the uh, Soviet Union stayed ahead of us in space research about up to the time that the uh, American astronauts landed on the moon. For example, uh, the Russians or the Soviets, they took the first pictures of the backside of the moon. I can remember our rockets, we were trying to do that and they were exploding. Uh, they were the first to fly to Venus and land a spacecraft on Venus. I mean, I'm just naming the comments, and they probably were the first to actually directly measure a thing called the solar wind, which I show in this diagram. Now, Explorer, uh, so we developed this data encoder for Explorer 12 and a duplicate on Explorer 14, which were launched successfully. Uh, this particular spacecraft had a very elliptical orbit. It went out very far from the Earth uh, to about 12 or 30. I just looked that up. And we discovered that not only, uh, not only was there the radiation belt in here, but there was a, a thing called the magnetosphere, wherein the solar wind would run into this obstacle, the magnetic field of the Earth, and form kind of a bullet-shaped boundary. In uh, fact, it was my close friend, John Freeman, whose instrument that I worked on for him, among other things, uh, that showed there was a pile up of this solar wind plasma coming out from the sun. It would pile up ahead of the magnetic field there and form this kind of bullet-shaped boundary. See, it's just like a bullet going through the air here. Uh, so that's a new word for you. To, I'll give you a quiz afterwards. Uh, that's a new word, the magnetosphere. It's a magnetic field. The Earth was surrounded by the solar wind, and there was a later shown to be a shock wave developed at that le uh, leading edge, just like a bullet going through the air. Uh, then, uh, well, after I got, after I and uh, another guy by the name of Gene Kohler, an uh, engineer that I worked with, by the way, Gene graduated. And he left me with the job <laughs> of finishing the encoder. I always remember that somehow. Oh, you're graduating? And he left me a job someplace else. So I became one of the uh, prime uh, digital data uh, designers. By the way, we did not have any computer at all at the University of Iowa. There was virtually none. Maybe there was at Illinois called ILIAC down there, but they were made out of tubes, not transistors. So I, I started de developing a, uh, a serious level of responsibility on a, a series of spacecraft that I show here. And they're the Engine Hawkeye series of satellites. This was Engine 1, and I'm sorry about the name. I didn't have anything to do with that. That was between the Navy and Van Allen. Uh, we were still being funded by the Navy all the way up to through Engine 3. Uh, I developed a data system on this, how to get all that data. We had 11 instruments. See, imagine you're given this problem. 11 instruments and you got to get all the data back to the ground somehow. And I believe I developed the first digital data system, which was flown on Engine 1. By the way, when it was successfully launched, we discovered, not unexpectedly, that we had 100 bits per second coming back from the spacecraft. And that accumulates pretty fast. I know 100 bits per second is not much these days, but we had no computer. And they finally bought a computer here on campus and uh, to, to, uh, to process the data. Uh, 
Now, uh, so these three were uh, funded by the Office of Naval Research, uh, which was through Van Allen, and he had these connections with the, uh, with the Navy. And uh, right at this point, we started getting funding from NASA. That's 1962, right there. So you can see it took a while for NASA to, you know, actually become effective in some sense. Uh, so, uh, so these I could I could tell you a lot about what they did, but one of the main things was study the aurora, and uh, you know the northern lights, how are they are produced and so forth. But I have to tell you some things about Engine Three, uh, which I was, by the way, the project engineer. It was my spacecraft. I mean, I was the guy, and I think I was probably a junior or senior. I was still an undergraduate. Uh, and not only me, there were numerous other graduate, undergraduates. It was mostly run by undergraduates, actually. Uh, Don Stillwell, uh, uh, Lou Frank. I can name a whole, a whole bunch of people back in that era. Now, uh, Engine 3. Uh, I happen to like that picture. <laughs> that was just something funny about it. <laughs> Was I that young once? And then notice the hair. <laughs> uh, there was a, a guy came to Iowa and gave a talk about strange sounds from space. Uh, he, his name was Roger Gallet, and he was from the National Bureau of Standards at Boulder, Colorado, and they didn't really have anything to do with the space program. That, that was just one of the curiosities. And I was so intrigued about this, I went out, I, I went down the basement of the old physics building, and I built a receiver. And these are down at audio frequencies, and it's really not hard to do that, actually. I took it out to my father's farm, and I, I, there was a specific phenomenon we call whistlers, and I heard some whistlers. And so I knew it worked. And uh, we had an antenna up here, which was a loop antenna, 50 turns of wire, and then essentially an audio amplifier. And I went to Van Allen, and I said, can we put this on the spacecraft? that I am in charge of, after all, I'm the project engineer. <laughs> and he said, sure. Now, what I want to say about that is, you notice how much it took to sell the project. <laughs> Nowadays, you can send proposals in there. You know, that thick to NASA, it may take a year to get uh, evaluated. You may or may not get selected, and, and maybe 10 years later, it gets flown. Uh, we were building these spacecraft in less than a year. And that uh, spacecraft was successfully launched, and I'm going to play for you whistlers. Now, whistlers are produced by lightning. So if you fly over a, lundering, a, a thunderstorm, you'll hear these whistling signals. They go tsh, 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 like that. So here we are flying over a thunderstorm, and here's what we picked up. Uh, and. Uh, each one of those is produced by a lightning storm. The reason it whistles is that the high frequencies travel faster than the low frequencies, so when the lightning stroke occurs, if you're some distance away due to the way the wave propagates through this plasma ionized gas medium up there, the high frequencies get there first and the lower frequencies and so forth. Uh, we also heard another, I'll call it musical sound, which had been heard on the ground before, but nobody had any idea how it was produced. And that's called Dawn Chorus. Is there anybody from England here? What does Dawn Chorus mean? Uh, I guess you haven't heard this term. That's the term the British uh, use for when the birds wake up in the morning. You've heard that. Thank you for confirming that. Uh, and I'm going to play it for you. Yeah, it's almost humorous, isn't it? This just goes on and on. And I showed, within just a matter of a, you know, a few months, uh, that the peak intensity of dawn chorus is right in the middle of the outer radiation belt. And that showed that it's the radiation belt electrons that are producing this sound. Now, it's an interesting fact that now, 60 years later, there are still people over in our physics building uh, trying to understand how that is produced. And I could give you a whole lecture on that, but we'll skip that.
Uh, it, it turns out to be a really important thing produced in, re one, for example, it actually accelerates some of the electrons. Uh, you kind of wonder, how did we get these really energetic sounds? Now, going on a little bit farther, there was a, now a NASA spacecraft called IMP-6, somewhat later. And on this kind of project, we had to actually propose how much money it was going to cost, and, and, and I got selected for an instrument to fly on it, and we had really long antennas, 100 meters tip to tip, just like a football field. Uh, beryllium copper tube that extends and so forth. And, uh, and, and, we, and, and this spacecraft went out quite far from the Earth, and we launched it. And there was another instrument, this is kind of like Van Allen discovering the radiation belt, except the public didn't get it quite the same way. But there's a guy that had, also had connected the same antenna, a radio uh, astronomer. And it, it had very great sensitivity, but not much dynamic range. And he called me up, his name was Bob So, and he says, I think our instrument failed. It's saturated. And I, and I told him, no, it's not saturated. The signals are just too strong. We were getting one volt R RMS, uh, root mean square amplitudes, on this 100 meter antenna. Uh, we had just, just discovered that the Earth is an immensely intense radio source and that that radiation comes from the magnetic field lines that connect with the aurora, you know, the northern lights? And these electrons coming down making the northern lights are getting together and making this radio sound. Now let me tell you how, how strong it is. I computed when I published this that the total radiation coming from the Earth was a thousand megawatts. Now, that's about like a nuclear power station, just to put it in a, in a perspective. Now, the frequency range is on your car, AM radio, it's, it's right in that frequency for AM radios, uh, 500 kilohertz, uh, several hundred kilohertz. Now, what is the power of a typical radio station? Well, in case you don't know, I'll tell you, it's like 10 kilowatts. Now, a thousand megawatts, I don't know, I don't know if I can do the mathematics, that's like a thousand times more powerful than any radio station we have on Earth. But it turns out, because of the presence of the Earth's ionosphere down here, those radio signals cannot get down on the ground. And uh, had they been able to do that, uh, you wouldn't be able to listen to WMT of Cedar Rapids. It would be just obliterated by this noise. I also make the little joke that if I had been a graduate student on Mars, studying, I could, I could be studying the radio emissions from the Earth. Now, this phenomena uh, has, there have been lots of scientists who have tried to explain it, and we now call it uh, the cyclotron maser. And I've just been given a hint that I have 10 more minutes here. But uh, I mean, it's attracted a lot of attention. It, it's, a, it's a really exotic uh, radio emission source that it turns out uh, occurs other places in the universe. Now, I'm not sure if this has any great significance for you, but as a scientist trying to understand how the universe works, it's one of the key mechanisms by which uh, radio signals are produced. Now, I'm going to switch the discussion now to other planets. And since I only have 10 minutes, I'm going to have to uh, hurry this up a bit. Uh, in the 19, early 60s, uh, we finally had a spacecraft uh, reach uh, Venus. Uh, the Russians had beat us there, by the way. And that was Mariner 2. And I have to say, I remember that era. They would launch a rocket with a spacecraft to go to uh, Venus, and the nose tone wouldn't come off. And it just seemed that we were just having failures like this. It was pathetic. It was better than during the, the Explorer 1 era, but it wasn't really all that good. We also flew to Mars with, uh, may, finally made it to Mars with Mariner 4. And neither of these planets had a magnetic field and therefore no radiation belt. So goodbye. We've hardly studied those before. Uh, then we started a series of missions to the outer planets. The outer planets are Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And one of those was, well, two of them actually, Pioneer 10 and 11, 
I competed to try to get a radio <coughs> receiver on this spacecraft, but I was not selected. Van Allen was. He had a, so he had a, a Geiger tube type instrument on that spacecraft. They had actually decided that they would concentrate on studying radiation there because you, you know we'd never been there. So we had to know whether they had a serious radiation belt that might make it very difficult to even operate a spacecraft. However, uh, so that was flown and uh, went, to, let's see, uh, Pioneer 10 went to Jupiter. Pioneer uh, 11 went to both Jupiter and by a feat of uh, celestial navigation also got to Saturn. However, now, so let's move on. Voyagers 1 and 2, I sent in a proposal. There were, I believe, 400 proposals to give you an idea how this works. And there were 10 selected, so your odds aren't good to begin with. But I did get selected to build an instrument on, on uh, Voyagers 1 and 2. And I don't know if the picture is very good, but you can see our antenna right here and right over here. There were two 10-meter, uh, tubular metal antennas. And that has been a tremendous... How many people have heard of Voyagers 1 and 2? Yeah, great mission. One of the greatest missions ever flown. Uh, it, uh, the objective was to fly to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And it took advantage of, uh, here's, here shows the trajectory, that's the sun, Earth's orbit there, here's Jupiter's orbit right there, here's Saturn's orbit, Uranus and Neptune. It took advantage of a certain lineup of those four planets out there where you could use gravity assist to go by Jupiter and the gravity of Jupiter would pull on the spacecraft and just about double the velocity. And they did it again at Saturn and then at Uranus and a little bit at Neptune. And we got to Neptune in 12 years. Uh, normally this alignment only occurs once every 179 years. So I lived in the right era that you could carry out with one spacecraft, actually we had two spacecraft, uh, that we could carry out this mission. Uh, and uh, now I'd like to spend, the, I'd like to, can I have another hour? <laughs> no, I think I'm getting a no over here. Uh, so we, we and it had, a, it had a really good camera on it, a Viticon. Uh, Pioneer 10 and 11 didn't really have any uh, camera of any significance. We took the first close-up pictures of all of these planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And uh, we discovered that Jupiter has a huge magnetosphere. You know, I told you about the Earth's magnetic uh, magnetosphere. Uh, if that's Jupiter, if you could see this magnetosphere, and you stand out and look at the moon some night, it's about, if you could see it, which you can't, <laughs> uh, it's about as big as the moon. So it's a really a huge object up there. And some people think that this is a, this is a kind of prototype pulsar because it produces copious radio emissions. And we have shown it's exactly the same mechanism that we have at Earth. I haven't done that, been numerous people have worked on this. Uh, not just myself, but it was one of my main interests. And we also discovered another curious thing, that there was a big ring, kind of a ring cloud of like sulfur and uh, various other, uh, we, we discovered that on the approach to Jupiter actually. And it, it was going around the orbit of a moon called Io. I don't know, anybody here ever heard of Io? It's one of the Galilean satellites. When Galileo looked through, first looked through a telescope, he saw Io, uh, Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Those are the four Galilean satellites. And, uh, and okay, so where did this cloud come from? Well, we flew up very close to Io. And this is what I often call the pizza picture. Looks like a pizza, right? <laughs> well, these black things are volcanoes. In fact, if you blow up an edge here, you can actually see the plume from the volcano going up 60 miles above the surface of Jupiter. And you can see the material coming down in a ring. We used to call those ringworms. Uh, and that material came down like snow. And uh, with the black dot in the center here is the, uh, is the volcano. So uh, Io is the most volcanic object uh, on Earth. Uh, not on Earth, uh, in the solar system. Uh, so, okay. Now, when our instrument, we got data back, we heard whistlers. 
kind of whistling tones. I don't know if you'll be able to hear this or not. They're very weak, but I'll try. Anybody hear that whistling tone? Yeah. Uh, when we saw these, we said, there's lightning at Jupiter. This was, the, this was the discovery of the first planet other than Earth that has lightning. And we have studied the lightning at Jupiter and also at Saturn extensively over the years. Now, here's a moon. Uh, I don't know, how many minutes do I have now? Five. Five, okay, I'll make it. Uh, okay, now the next moon out, Europa. Here's a picture of Europa. And that is water ice. But you will notice all the cracks in the ice. Uh, it is now believed that there is a water, liquid water ocean under this ice. And these are ice flows that are cracking up, but probably it freezes quickly in between. In fact, you can, uh, I'm having trouble with the pointer again. Anyway, you can see that some of, the, uh, some of these pieces fit together, the ice flows. Uh, now, why are we so interested in that? Well, it has to do with looking for life elsewhere. It is believed that water is an essential element of life. And up to this point, the only place we knew where liquid water existed uh, is at Earth. And there is a lot of interest now in going to Europa. And, the, and uh, we are involved in that, actually, not so much me, but some other people I'll tell you about later. The thinking is that life originated at, at the bottom of the ocean here at Earth, at these uh, we call geothermal vents. That's a theory, anyway. And you could very well have these kind of geothermal vents at Europa. And the long-term objective, get this, is to put a submarine down there and find out. <laughs> Uh, now, I told you about the solar wind, and this should give you a visual idea of the solar wind. You can almost see this stuff coming out from the sun. Well, the question had been asked for a long time, well over 50, 60 years, where does the solar wind stop? And there were various theories about this, but one of them was that uh, there's the sun in the middle, and this solar wind is coming out at a very high supersonic speed, and that there's a gas between the stars called the interstellar medium, and this solar wind would someday have to be stopped by, this, uh, by the uh, interstellar gas. There were estimates of where, and I, I can, I'm not gonna show it to you, but there's a whole list, a lot of my friends are on this list actually, saying it was at five astronomical units. That's where Jupiter, well, we didn't find it at five astronomical units. Uh, so you'll just have to take my word about that model and so forth. But my instrument, our instrument, uh, which studies plasma waves, uh, we, sh we finally detected when we reached the interstellar medium. It was 37 years after the launch of Voyager 1. That was like about three years ago that we reported. And that was reported worldwide and lots of comments. Voyager 1 goes interstellar LA Times. Another quote, to go boldly. I think that I've heard that somewhere in Star Wars or someplace. <laughs> Star Trek. Star Trek, right. Yeah, it's like circumnavigating the globe for the first time or having a footprint on the moon for the first time. Uh, I mean, that's what the world thought of this. And, uh, and it's our instrument that we built here at Iowa that did it. Now, okay, I'm supposed to finish up in about a minute now, or two minutes. So I'll tell you about some other things going on in the department, uh, well, that I was involved in also. Uh, since we do radio things, that's what we do here, my group does anyway, uh, I was asked by the head of JPL if I would like to fly a, an instrument on a European spacecraft. I'm still having trouble making this work, but let me say it's this, uh, the one on the left there. So we have a 140 tip-to-tip -tip antenna. You can see it there. And it's, in order, it's Mars Express. It's a European spacecraft. Not, probably half of my projects have been connected with European. That's, that's the... Foreign, foreign relations foreign thing. Relations thing. <laughs> uh, and it's a radar. It's a radar that would send out radio pulses, and we were, look, we were looking for water at Mars. Uh, 
that, that was the objective of the mission. And it was launched in June 2nd, 2003, so that would be uh, 15 years ago. Very successful mission. We didn't find liquid water, but we found all kinds of permafrost. Uh, means a lot of water in the ground. It's in an ice age, like up in Alaska. Um, and let's see what else. We also measured the thickness of the polar ice caps, which is not in that picture, but Mars does have ice caps, and uh, they're like uh, four kilometers thick. It's a lot of a lot of water ice at Mars. So now there's another project called MAVEN, and I can't remember what that acronym stands for. And there's another professor in our department, which we hired just recently, about three or four years ago, uh, Jasper Helicus. And uh, that's in orbit around Mars. And Mars turns out to have an atmospheric pressure only about 1% of that of the Earth. And the question is, where did the atmosphere go? Because we believe at one time in the distant past, it had a dense atmosphere like we do. And they've actually shown that the solar wind uh, sweeps the atmospheric gas away from Mars uh, permanently. It doesn't come back. And uh, of course, uh, one of the big reasons that the Earth is protected, the magnetic field of the Earth uh, protects us from uh, some extent from the solar wind. Otherwise, we'd have our atmosphere blown away to some extent by the solar wind. Uh, you see the, uh, the long-range sort of implications that space research sometimes has. Uh, we currently have two spacecraft in the Earth's orbit studying the radiation belt of the Earth. Sixty years after it was first discovered, we're still learning things about the radiation. Uh, Craig Kletzing in our department is, at least locally, one of the people that are leading that effort. I'm not really involved. Do you get the, do you get the hint about what's happening to me? Uh, yeah, I just I just uh, applied for uh, phase retirement last August, and two more years, and I'm I'm out of here. <laughs> I don't know if I really would like that. I don't like that letter when I read it. Actually, <laughs> I shouldn't have applied for it. Actually, now here's some big missions that are coming. Jasper Helicus is on a mission to fly to the sun. That's called a solar probe. And it's going to go in very close to the sun. And uh, now I actually am involved in the record on that issue. Uh, I built a, uh, my group built, I should keep saying that, a uh, radio receiver that's flown on a German spacecraft, more international. Yeah, good. Right. Uh, and I have, a, I have a story about that, but I've, I've got enough to. Uh, how he, how we got into that. Actually, they wanted to build a nuclear reactor. And NASA didn't really think that was a good idea for the Germans to be <laughs> building a nuclear reactor. And just said, why don't you build a spacecraft to go to the sun? And that was called Helios 1 and 2. And I worked with the Germans to make that thing happen. And we got well inside the orbit of Mercury. But this is going to get much closer. They're going to break our record. Uh, now, the, uh, there's two other missions, one called Europa Clipper, that's a NASA mission. There's another one, one called JUICE missions, mission, that's a European mission, and JUICE stands for, can't quite remember, Jupiter Icy Satellites or something. <laughs> I can't remember, I'm not, in, I'm not in charge of that. But the whole idea is to fly a radar and measure the thickness of the ice. You see, if the ice is reasonably thin, 100 meters, we can probably melt our way through the ice and get a submarine down there. If it's 10 kilometers thick, the general thinking is, no, we can't do it. So the first thing to do is to go to Europa and measure the thickness of the ice. And if it's thin enough, then potentially a submarine mission to go under the ice into the water down there and look for look for uh, geothermal vents and, and, and other, other creatures. So th this question is for the, for the Voyager launches, how tight were the launch windows, days, hours? And then which came first, the idea of the Voyager missions or identifying the planetary alignments for the gravity assist? Well, okay. Uh, does that make uh, Yeah. Uh, the, the launch window, oh yeah, into the mic, yeah. Uh, the launch windows were quite narrow, as I remember it, about two weeks. And that was in uh, August 
uh, August of, of 1977 and early September 77. And that was, a, that was a really, you know, if we didn't make that launch window, talking about pressure, uh, you'd wait 179 years. And I mean, you know, I, I'll tell you, among the people I really admire are project managers. There's a guy by the name of David Dale at the European Space Agency who I admire. Uh, he was the manager of a project called Giotto, which is a European spacecraft to intercept the comet Halley. You remember Halley? Yeah. I have to say, I can't remember what his orbital period is, but it's something like 100 years. And he was in charge of the European mission. And he did, you know, they had a launch window somewhere around a week. He either got it off on its way and, and they carried it out successfully. Voyager's kind of like that. You just had to make, early in my career with the Navy projects, we flew on several Navy rockets along with classified satellites. Uh, and they had a weighted mock-up of our spacecraft made out of aluminum. And if we weren't there, they'd just bolt that in the spacecraft and fly it without us. So that's, that's the way our life, especially these planetary missions. Sorry, I took a long time to answer that. Sorry. You know. We got time. We got time. Uh, what causes the radiation in the belt discovered by Van Allen, and what causes the solar wind? Yeah, yeah, boy, those are really two good questions. Uh, let me talk about the radiation belt. That has, that, uh, you can explain how particles can get trapped there. But that doesn't explain why they're there at MEV energies. I mean, MEV is a really high energy. The particles go right through your body, you know. Uh, and that, that's, been a, that's been a puzzle. These particles get accelerated during magnetic storms. And what are magnetic storms? Well, there are these explosions on the sun called solar flares. And there's a big puff of gas comes out, takes about two days to get to the Earth. And when that interacts with the uh, Earth's magnetic field, you see all these energetic particles. Well, we have, I should have brought my book. I have a book on plasma physics. <laughs> and there's discussion about how that works. Let me leave it there. Can I? <laughs> That's why they have the, uh, the Van Allen storm probes are up operating right now. There's two spacecraft, and that's the kind of stuff they're trying to explain. Okay, let's do, let's do one more. This question asks, how active and successful is NASA today? What is its funding? Well, okay, NASA. What is the, what is the situation at NASA? Uh, well, there has been for probably at least 25, 30 years, a, uh, a kind of a gentleman's agreement that they would split the money about half between human spaceflight and half on robotic spacecraft. You may very well guess that I work with robotic spacecraft. And uh, uh, we've gotten ourselves in a bad situation, I think, because we're not flying. The shuttle was not very... Uh, uh, effective. Uh, they sold it to launch 50 launches a year, and we were lucky to get three. So it was actually a marvelous vehicle, but it just wasn't cost effective. And we are now in the situation where the Russians' uh, space program has to carry our astronauts up to the uh, space station. Now, there's a big rocket being developed right now called the uh, S. LS, the uh, Space Launch System, also called the, Saturn, uh, the uh, Senate Launch System. <laughs> and I think they're going to launch that in about another year. And of course, its, it's, it's objective <laughs> was to go to Mars, take humans to Mars, but that has recently been abandoned, uh, and probably for good reasons at least for, because going to Mars and coming back alive uh, is not easy. Uh, minimum mission to Mars and back is about three years. Uh, so um, so that it's been changed that we go back to the moon. Of course, we've been there, done that, from some people's point of view, <laughs> mine in particular. But, but you can go back and practice. And 
Uh, some of us are worried that the cost to run the human space program, uh, which is huge, could eat our lunch. And, uh, you know, I would be out on the streets, but I'm going to retire anyway. Uh, so, you know, we, it's, it's a state of flux now, I think I would say. Okay. Is that enough that's to that's give, give you kind of a feeling for where we're at? I thought maybe they're going to launch members of the Senate into outer space. No. <laughs> okay. just, I'll, just keep, like, I'll keep that in mind. No. Okay, we're going to conclude our program, and let's give a big thank to, thanks to Don Garnett. So I want to thank our sponsors, University of Iowa's International Programs, University of Iowa's Honors Program, the University of Iowa Public Policy Center, Stanley UI Foundation Support Organization, and today's special sponsors, Conrad Schultz and Karen Wallace Chapel, and we thank City Channel 4. Uh, Don, as a token of our appreciation, we'd like to present you with our coveted Iowa City Foreign Relations Council mug. There you go. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you. I did, I did interject a few foreign relations. You did. We appreciate it. We appreciate it. We are adjourned. Thank you.